Hi there, I'm Georgie Ainsley, and every week I talk to someone who is a performance person. They could be an athlete from the world of entertainment, business, or politics. They could even be an astronaut. The key link is, of course, that they all know how to perform at the top level, and they can teach us all a thing or two about how to do that in our own lives at whatever it is that we do. Performance People is available wherever you get your podcasts, or of course, you can watch us on YouTube, where you can also subscribe. And please do. This week, I'm speaking to Tim Spector OBE, who's an award-winning scientist and author with over a thousand original articles published in some of the world's top scientific journals, placing him in the top 1% of most cited scientists on the planet. His book, The Diet Myth, raised the importance of the gut microbiome for human health for a wide non-scientific audience. It became an international bestseller and remains a brilliant insight to the unique way each of us interacts with food through our microbes. He's studied extensively the scientific evidence on what we eat, how we eat and why, so we can use that knowledge to improve our own personal nutrition. The old paradigm of food was just about calories and fats and sugars nothing else mattered as long as you got your protein you're fine don't care about anything else turns out that's completely wrong well the epidemiology modeling suggests we could reduce disease by 70 or 80 percent if we switched from from our current uh, ultra processed food diets to a optimal healthy diet a new way of looking at medicine which is with this preventive mindset um, and realizing that exercise and diet really are really important treatments that should be part of the, the whole health system and currently are not. So, Tim, where do we start with the subject of food? Where do you where do you tend to start with the subject of food when you're talking to people about how much it can play a significant role in your life and the various outcomes? I start by saying that your food choices are probably the most important things you can do for your health. And I don't think it's been fully appreciated before. We've just assumed that we all have a standard way of eating and there's a good way and a bad way. And it's straightforward. You just got to go on the internet and it's, it's a dot all and just follow instructions on the packet and you'll be fine. And really the last 10 years I've discovered nothing is further from the truth than that. Um, if we made all better food choices, we would be able to reduce most aging related disease by about 70 or 80%. And we would have um, uh, 10 more years, say, of healthy living. So it could be incredible benefits if we did manage to choose the right foods. But I don't want to lose sight of the fact that eating good food is incredibly fun. and it's a major social activity, and a lot of the studies of, say, longevity and blue zones, etc., uh, come up with the same finding that people who eat together in communities, in families, in large groups, spend time eating, are healthier and live better lives. So we've got to find this blend of choosing the right foods, but also eating in the right context in a way that isn't negative, it is very positive. How how catastrophic then can eating bad foods be for you? And and does that happen at a particular time in people's lives where it starts to have a really big impact? Um, does that happen when you're children or perhaps later? What you know, when do you start having to make really good food choices in order to help your longevity? I think at all ages, really, um, we haven't done the, the perfect study to know which is more crucial than others, it sort of depends on your goal. Clearly, if children are important, because whatever you do is going to last them a long time and get them into mm. habits and things they may not be able to change. But equally, if you're in your 70s and you know you want to maintain your sporting abilities and your, uh, your muscle mass, then choosing the right sort of foods to eat is also important to reduce cancers and things. So I don't think there's any good or bad time. And we've found there are a few specific areas like the female menopause, for example, that in that perimenopausal period, women dramatically change their response to foods 
mm. in a in a way that so they they can't eat the same food that they were eating just a few years before with the same way. So it will have metabolic consequences, make them gain weight, etc. So I think all all periods of life really are are important. I wouldn't want to um, overemphasize one, and I think it. And really, you can make improvements at any age. I think that's the key. And, and just because you've, you know, may have had a been Bradley brought up, and you can blame your parents for feeding you rubbish food all your life, I don't think it's an excuse not to give it a go now. No, quite. I mean, there's always a moment, isn't there, where you can reset the clock. On the subject of on the subject of the clock, how important is the circadian rhythm in all of this, so that you're eating the right foods at the right times of day for what your system requires in order to process it in the right way? I think it's really important, and the research in the last five years is is backing this up. That uh, we've known for a long time that sleep is important. And sleep is all part of our clock mechanism, allowing our body to shut down and repair itself. And, you know, it's, it's intricately linked to our health and our mental well-being. And having consistent patterns of sleep are also very important. And the same way our gut microbes also have a circadian rhythm. So, um, this is the microbiome, the community of, of gut bugs we have in all of us. They have genes and they have clocks in them. So they also depend on periods of rest. So the modern way of living, which is to have about six meals a day, often finishing with cake and bickies in front of the telly, um, is really bad because it doesn't give your microbes that rest period that you that they need as well. So there's lots of studies now showing that you need to really rest your gut as much, as well as your brain. And so sleep and eating patterns need to be constrained into times of activity in your circadian rhythm. And the rest of the time, you really need to be relaxing to maximize your health. So I think these are all new insights and it's all starting to fit together. Uh, as we understand more about circadian clocks, we understand more about gut microbes, our genes, uh, and the way our, our body works and repairs itself. So. Unless you give your body time to repair itself, it can't do a good job on your immune system. It can't fight cancer. It can't fight aging, etc. And you won't get the optimum uh, gut microbes growing either. So can you put that into the context of what a, a, a good day would look like in terms of your diet, in terms of the clock, in terms of what you eat and when you eat it? Okay, so a good day in... The context of, say, the UK, where, you know, because each country has different cultural norms about when they get up and when they eat, etc. But uh, in the UK, you would um, have eight hours perfect sleep. Uh, not everyone achieves that. And generally, if you can get seven hours, you're doing pretty well. There are some sleep gurus who claim that you need eight, but there's no hard evidence that's true. There is a genetic variation in how much sleep people need. And the people that could exist on, you know, five or six are quite small, um, but they probably do exist. But in general, aim for, aim for over seven hours. And high quality sleep, that's also important. So you don't, um, um, you're not drinking heavily or taking other medications and things that upset that. So, you might say go to bed at 11 o'clock and you'd be waking up at um, 6.30 or, or 7. And uh, what I, I do now is I, I fast. So I would have some black tea or black coffee at that time. Might do some exercise and I probably wouldn't have my first meal until 11 o'clock. Really? And that would allow me 14 hours. Um, or so overnight, so I'm not actually uh, ingesting anything that's going to excite my microbes. And it's really, really important to have periods of so activity and rest, and they're clearly separated. And we've done studies with um, with Zoe uh, on something called social jet lag, and people who do vary in their activities 
um, say at weekends, so consistently go to bed at, uh, a couple of hours later at the weekend and lie in, mm. have worse metabolic health the next day. So actually they um, feel more tired, they uh, actually hungrier, and their metabolism uh, gets out of kilter. So although, you know, we all need to party occasionally and, and do these things, if there is a way of keeping a consistent pattern throughout your week, then your body actually uh, really likes you for it. And I think this is what athletes also realize, that it's it's generally good for their training to have these set times. And what we've also learned from Zoe is that everyone's different. So, you know, some people prefer to fast in the mornings. Some people prefer to fast in the evenings, not eat after 6 p.m. Uh, other people don't like to fast at all. and they actually like to eat small amounts throughout the day. So there is no absolute perfect um, day. Uh, I, I was giving you a sort of an equivalent, someone like myself, but it's just to illustrate the sort of things that are going through my mind about those, those eating uh, activity, exercise periods in the, in the day. And then, of course, we get on to, you know, what you eat and how that it, it affects your mood and um, energy levels, et cetera, which we now know um, are also extremely important and which we didn't think of before. We'd, the old paradigm of food was just about calories and fats and sugars. Nothing else mattered. As long as you've got your protein, you're fine. Don't care about anything else. Turns out that's completely wrong and that um, you really want to uh, personalize in a way your sugar spikes, your fat spikes. Uh, these have really big effects on your inflammation and your mood and your energy um, up to three or four hours later. So I think it's all about people understanding their bodies more and getting in tune with it. And I don't think there's one size fits all, but these are sort of things that people, you know, in the modern world with the, with the new sec technology we've got need to start thinking about. It's interesting that you mention mood, isn't it? Because it is one of those things that if you, you know, it's all very well not to get enough sleep, but the effect that that has on you the next day, the decisions you end up making, I always think exercise is a big part of this as well, because in your, in your world, where do you see exercise slotting in? Is it something that you should be doing a little bit of every day in some form or another? Or is, I mean, how big a part of that is, is the pit? How big a part of the picture is exercise, as well as as well as the diet and the sleep piece? I think it's very important, but I think again it's personalised, mm. and there's no doubt there is a genetic. We did twin studies twenty years ago showing that how much exercise people do has a genetic component. So it means that some people get a real buzz out of. Uh, running at five in the morning and for other people it's the worst possible punishment you could give them <laughs> and they feel terrible and we mustn't all assume that everyone really does want to run at five o'clock on a cold january morning and there is these differences between people and other activities might be better for them um but we're yet to really personalize this we're starting to do this in zoe because we are seeing some people do better if they run uh, after eating and others if they run it after fasting for example and there are some subtle differences between men and women in what the proportions are so it's still early days and we're trying to sort that out but i think we in the future we will be able to personalize a bit more advice about exercise but at the moment i think it's uh important people really to be exercising their bodies as much as possible uh, just like you would any machine. Mm. And if you want the blood to be flowing properly, uh, you know, every now and again, you get your, your car out of the garage and you give it a run. If it does, if it's not doing anything for, for several months, you know, it clogs up. And I think the same idea is keeping everything running, keeping your muscles going, um, and getting your heart rate up to maximum, uh, every now and again is really important. I don't think anyone really knows the, optimum times for each person at each age but i mean personally you know i like to do some exercise every day i don't feel good if i don't but i know other people that seem to be quite happy on three times a week and 
the sort of it's hard to know from the epidemiology <clears throat> what these averages really mean. Um, and I think government guidelines are probably a bit on the low side of saying, well, if you just walk briskly for three times a week, you know, for for half an hour, you're fine. Uh, I think that seems a bit on the low side. But again, you know, some people might be able to get away with that and, and others not. But it's, a, it's more about listening to your own body and coming to your own conclusions, I feel. Uh, realizing that everyone has different thresholds and mm -hmm. different people get different pleasures from sport than others. Do you snack? And how criminal is snacking? Well, snacking, we found uh, when we did our, our big snacking survey, uh, accounts a for about 23% of all UK calories. So huge amounts wow. of uh, our energy comes from snacks, which we didn't used to do. And certainly when I was a kid, you know, snacks were a real rare treat. If you get your mum to give you a snack, it was, you know, like, like you'd, you'd done something amazing. Um, <laughs> now it's, now people don't send their kids to school unless they're loaded up with uh, little treats so they don't faint before lunch. <laughs> and, um, most, the vast majority of snacks are really bad for you because they're ultra processed. They're basically, you know, artificially made food like substances, which is what I call ultra processed. And they may have low fat stickers on them, low calorie stickers, and increasingly high protein stickers on them. That's just a warning sign. This is extremely bad for you and uh, should be avoided. Um, there are, as I said, some people do really feel if you take away their snacks, they shake and they, you know, they, they get a bit nervous. And I've got some colleagues like this. So we did some experiments with um, uh, Jonathan Wolf, the, <clears throat> my co-founder at Zoe. And uh, he hates it if his snacks are taken away. But <laughs> swap those, you know, swap the horrible artificial ones with a bit of fruit, apple, pear, uh, some nuts. He's very happy. And so I think. There are some healthy snacks. Uh, try not to have them late at night. Mm. Um, try to have them closer to your meals so you're clustering your food uh, moments, if you like, together. You're not spreading out that eating period. And then I think you can get away with it. But, you know, we have far too many snacks, and that's really driven by marketing rather than by our hunger. And, you know, we should be eating our food around our meals. You know, if you Find the need to snack or eat more at your main meal is is what I'd be saying. And all these sports snacks and things like this to repair your body, they're all nonsense. There's no need that no evidence you suddenly need a protein bar just after having gone to the gym. Uh, that's pure marketing. Yes, I mean, do you get frustrated with, with that? Because you must see it everywhere. In every supermarket you walk into, in every you know facility where they are, they are selling the dream. Do you do you get frustrated by the marketing spiel uh, when you when you know what's behind it? The, for the rest of us, we can we can sort of ignorance can be bliss up to a point. Yeah, I'm frustrated, but I also feel sorry for the general public that you know are being sold these complete duds. They're being...